Welcome. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here today. My name is Rebecca Trawick. I'm the director and curator of the Wignall Museum at Chafee College. Thank you for joining us at today's artist talk featuring Eric Tenorio, presented as part of Collective Care, Uncovering Identity, and in honor of a day without art. Collective Care, Uncovering Identity is a collaborative series of programs developed by the Center for Culture and Social Justice and the Wignall Museum that bring together artists and community around issues relevant to the LGBT plus community and that look at the intersection of identity and the arts. A Day Without Art was started in 1989 by Visual Aids in response to the worsening AIDS crisis. The original goals called out for mourning and action in response to the AIDS crisis that would celebrate the lives and achievements of lost colleagues and friends, encourage caring for all people with AIDS, educating diverse publics about HIV infection, and finding a cure. More than 30 years later, arts organizations take part annually to encourage education, celebration, engagement, and awareness. Please note the Wignall Museum of Contemporary Art aims to present diverse, innovative programming that engages contemporary subjects, social issues, and artistic themes. Sometimes presentations may contain provocative or otherwise sensitive content for some viewers. Before I introduce you to Eric, I wanna introduce you to Dr. Letty Romo, Director of Student Equity and Engagement and Collaborative Partner in Collective Care. I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. I'm gonna to go ahead and read off our um, land acknowledgement uh, and my, um, my technology has changed a little bit and so I'm still getting used to it. Uh, with respect and honor for the lands where Chafee College resides and the leaders who came before us, we'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the Garileño Tongva peoples, the original stewards of these sacred and unceded homelands. The Tongva people's history, languages, cultural traditions and legacy continue to shape this region and we recognize their continuing presence in their homelands. In the spirit of truth and equity, Chafee College commits to uplifting the voice of indigenous peoples, building an inclusive and equitable educational environment and decolonizing the institution. We also encourage members of the Chafee College community to learn about the land they reside on and their original caretakers and advocate for culturally responsive action. Thank you. So today I'm very pleased to introduce artist Eric Tenorio. Eric is a SoCal based photographer and queer HIV plus, uh, sorry, HIV positive Filipino American. Tenorio graduated from the School of Visual Arts, SVA in New York City after completion of his AA in photography here at Chafee College. He uses his art to provoke viewers to question and confront new perspectives, to encourage discussion and understanding and to explore different realities. Please join me in giving Eric a warm virtual welcome. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Roman. Thank you, everyone. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So yes, uh, like Rebecca said, my name is Eric Tenorio. My pronouns are he, him, his. And just a little uh, background. Um, like she said, I'm a queer Filipino American. I was born and raised in SoCal. Um, I've been doing photography now for 10 plus years. And I was diagnosed with HIV in 2012 when I was 22 years old. So I'm gonna just start off with discussing my work uh, pre-HIV and my, the way I dealt with photography, the way I focused on my photography before I got my status. Uh, my work was very um, by the assignment Whatever the assignment was given, I would just do whatever was asked of me. There wasn't really an in-depth look of what I was doing. Um, and my, I was passionate about photography, but I wasn't uh, fully invested at the time. I was just doing what I had to do to get by and get like a solid grade. Um, my work was focusing on assignments, but also I started focusing more on myself with my self portraits, which started as just a way to get around not using models. But a professor told me to start photographing myself, 
I then started photographing myself because I wanted to. And then um, that also just started forming my idea of my queer identity and my sense of style of my work and um, moving forward. Um, when I was diagnosed with HIV, when I was 22 years old, it obviously turned my world upside down. Um, it was very jarring to me. It was something that obviously a lot of people think that we'll never get because of just, you know, their way of thinking. But I did get HIV when I was 22. And um, it really gave me a drive in my work to go forward and pursue the things I wanted to do and reach the goals that I wanted to reach and not have anything hold me back anymore. Um, so I started really pushing myself and my work to do uh, ideas I never thought I would ever really do and playing with themes of femininity, masculinity, playing with materials and just seeing how that would go and how I really thought about it in connection with myself and my identity. So um, during the time of me being HIV positive, I decided to apply for the student invitational, which then led me into applying uh, for SVA. So the student invitational was a really big way for me to really push myself to where I wanted to be and what I wanted to do with my photography. I wanted to explore my masculinity and femininity, my love for theatricality and combining those two in a, with, within the domestic setting itself and really um, playing around with those elements. So I would photograph myself in my house, my aunt's house, I would have my makeup done, and then I would take these fabrics and materials that I thought were really beautiful and then wrap myself up in it or um, just make an outfit of it, as you, as you see. The work was really um, like powerful to me and it really showed people who I was as a photographer and showed myself who I was as a photographer. Oh, I'm sorry, there is a shark vacuum going off right now where I'm at. So hold on a second. <laughs> sorry about that. So anyways, yeah, so this work was really just a way to explore, like I said, my femininity and masculinity and my theatricality and my queer identity itself and the way, I, what I thought about it for myself and how I viewed myself and how I want the world to kind of see a different part of me. This is also what led me to apply to art school. Uh, art school for me was kind of just something I knew I was gonna do at some point. I wasn't really going for it before, but then when I got my status, that's when I really realized I wanted to go to art school. I really wanted to continue my education and try to push my photography. So I started applying for schools. Well, sorry, I applied for one school. I didn't do any backups. I know that was bad of me, but I applied to SVA and I got in. And this is kind of the work that I showed and everything that got me into SVA. Okay, so my journey through SVA. Um, before SVA, my work was, like I said, self-portraits, but um, I was really just focusing on like kind of a fashion element and not really, and kind of covering myself and hiding myself still within like makeup and materials and clothing and fabrics and everything. And so when I got to SVA, I really wanted to try something different. And so I started to photograph myself uh, nude with very like kind of different kind of colored lights and lights that had different kind of uh, projections and everything to kind of really give myself, give my work more layers and kind of a nightlife, queer nightlife 
kind of feel with it. So I would photograph myself around New York City in my dorm room or friends I'd made in New York in their New York apartments. And it was just a way to kind of explore myself and really explore my relationship with my body and how I felt with my body and how did I feel good in it? Did I not feel good? It was a really good way to kind of like start the conversation with myself to really explore, did I love my body? Did I love the skin I was in? And so it really helped me um, be more body positive, but also really helped me embrace my body and the body that I was given and still be able to play with those themes of masculinity and femininity and theatricality. And this idea of like dance being in, put into my work and posing in different ways to really like push my body to see what my body could do within the poses. As you can see in the, in the beginning of SVA work, I did, I never showed my face. And then my senior year actually is when I started showing my face and like full frontal of my body. And I really wanted to start connecting with the queer men in my life that I had made friends with in SVA um, or in New York City. And it was kind of a nice passive of, of knowledge of like, sometimes they were younger than me, sometimes they were older than me. And actually some of them had dealt with HIV too. So it was a nice a passing of knowledge from a younger to older person or and vice versa. And so it made the connection with me and this person this, in these photographs even stronger. And I felt even stronger connection with them after the photo was taken. And so I didn't also like stay, I, didn't stick to like one age range. I definitely would go for older men as well and to photograph with, to befriend, just because their knowledge of like what I was going through was also really prominent because they had gone through a, the, lived through the HIV epidemic when they were young. And so to gain that kind of knowledge from them and to gain that experience kind of helped form my identity and what I wanted to do with my work as well. Because I think with my work, I wanted to explore my identity, but also explore my HIV status and what that means to me and what that means to the people around me. Because with my work, I want to be able to start a conversation about HIV and how even though we have come like so far in treatments and in like the sur surviving this uh, disease and everything, this illness, um, I want to talk, build a conversation still around it though, because even though we have PrEP and even though we are, we've moved really far ahead of our time since then, we still have such a stigma within, within the gay community, but also just within the community as a general, where there is a stigma and a fear of someone who has HIV. And so with my work going forward, I was trying to create a conversation to be upfront with it as well. So after I graduated SVA, it was a big change for me just because I was so used to being in school. I was in school for how many years of my life and I was always on a strict kind of schedule. And so after SVA, I graduated and then I decided to take a break from photography just to kind of relax after doing like months of nonstop shooting and work. I decided to take a break. And then when I dived back into my work, um, I hit a wall. I tried going back to what I was doing at SVA and I couldn't figure out what I was doing. And so I started printing out my work um, old, just on regular printer paper and I started printing out all my old photographs and tearing them apart and putting them back together and just taking past me, um, present me and putting together to kind of build a new image of me and possibly a future me. And it was a way for me to 
re-explore my past work and what that work looks like to me now as a different person. And if I still have the same ideals, the same morals, the same thoughts about it when I took that photo at that time and how much I've changed and grown since then. I was still exploring my body at the time as well, just as this person that like now had this whole big future for them and figuring out what I wanted to do with my life after I graduated. I was just doing what I always do during times where I felt kind of lost, where I just started, I just started shooting stuff. Um, that was like a way for me to keep going is to just, no matter what kind of idea I had, I was always just get the idea, shoot it. If I like it, I like it. If I don't like it, then it's fine. But it was a way to just a cathartic experience to try to move forward and try to see what I could do more of. A lot of my work going forward, I did a lot with like fake flowers, as you saw in the previous images of the collage and the one before this. I was just using flowers as a way to just kind of something that was in a sense, it is a lot um, flowers are alive, but I was using fake flowers because I love this idea of it never dying and always being beautiful. And I wanted to like surround myself with that and surround my collages with it as well. I wanted to also get back into photographing people. After photographing myself all the time, I sometimes needed a break and I wanted to photograph other people and it's obviously a different experience photographing yourself when you're and photographing another person. So it was a nice way for me to explore relationships with other men, with men again in my life, but then have it just be of them at times as well. And not just me and him or me and this person. So after shooting for all the time and just doing what I was doing, uh, the pandemic hit. And I think like everyone, the, when the pandemic hit, uh, we felt this urge to kind of, you know, be present and like create work and be productive. And so for a good chunk of time, I was very productive uh, during the pandemic. I was photographing myself all the time just to keep myself busy and to kind of remind myself that I was still there, that I was still capable of doing stuff, that yes, COVID-19 was this worldwide pandemic, but I was like, I can still do stuff. I can still create work and create art. And it was a way to like keep me going. But then definitely there was a time where at a certain point I just hit a wall again and the pandemic really got to me and my world just was not the same. The world wasn't the same anymore and I wasn't the same. And I just felt lost. And so I just stopped shooting altogether for months during the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and then after the break or after my huge break, I started working out. I started working out from home because the gyms were still closed and everything. And I used to work out all the time before the pandemic. And it was a way to just like another way to de-stress and relax and, you know, get some aggression out. But then when I was working out, I decided to do a photo every day of a workout to kind of keep me um, accountable, but also just to kind of have fun and like start taking photos again and give me a different subject and a different kind of style of photography where I wasn't really using different colored lights. I was using gels. Um, I wasn't really using studio lights as much. And I was just photographing myself in my garage every day with these like um, workout stuff and like these weights and these benches and just kind of trying out different things, but also just working out and just having fun again with photography. 
and it kind of opened up my eyes to photography again and really like gave me more of like a drive and a passion for it again after not shooting for months and just kind of being brought down by the pandemic and not feeling like just really positive anymore so doing the workouts every day and like like here I swam and then I decided to take some photos after with the lighting so it really was just a way to keep me sharp but also just like keep me aware that I'm still alive and that I'm still capable of doing things even during like such a scary time of our lives. The workouts also was a way to kind of keep me healthy, obviously, like mentally and physically, because I think with the pandemic, it really, um, there was a time where I had a scare with COVID-19 and I realized that I wasn't obviously, again, um, invincible. And so COVID-19 could hurt me too. And so I had a scare at one point and it really shook me again. And it kind of gave me, I had like rec like memories of when I found out I was HIV positive and it kind of reconnected it to back to me again how I felt so invincible before HIV and then I got it and then I was scared about COVID to a certain extent and then when I thought I almost got it it really changed my world again and so the workout photos also helped me kind of dealt with my anxiety and pushing forward and figuring out if I was okay and kind of keep myself centered and focused. So my future going forward with all the stuff that I've been doing now shooting more often, still doing stuff that I did in SBA, like portraits of queer men, doing my collage work. I want to explore more and do more things and just see what else I was capable of. So some of the new work I'm working on right now is more of a focus on my, me being a queer Filipino American and what that means to me and what do I really identify with? Like, I really am proud of being queer. I'm really proud of being Filipino, but like, am I really proud of being an American, I guess? And how that all intertwines and do, is it wrong that I'm more prideful about one thing than the other? Or how do I balance all of it together? And what these flags mean to everyone you when you see someone with a queer uh, with a pride flag or with an american flag or just a flag of their heritage you automatically get a sense of like who they are as a person and kind of like an idea of like what their ideals and morals are and i have my own thoughts when i see someone with a pride flag or with a filipino flag or with an american flag flying um in front of their house or on their car and so it's a nice, it's been, it's me exploring that and my assumptions about people and my people's assumptions about me when they find out I'm a queer Filipino American. There's a work, I cannot remember the photographer's name, but after I did this, a friend of mine brought him up. It was the work of soldiers who uh, tied up these um, prisoners, I think, or something. And he referenced this photo. He referenced that photo to this photo. And this was just like an idea of me wrapping myself up in these flags and in a way suffocating myself and trying to feel connected to um, 
these identities that I ha have and what I felt about them. We see flags everywhere when we're when you walk around. Mostly, you see American flags. Obviously, you sometimes see uh, other flags that are being waved around. Especially and also obviously during Pride Month, you see a lot of the Pride flags. And so, go up since then, I've been photographing like every flag I see. Obviously, I see more Pride and American American flags and Pride flags, and I definitely don't see really Filipino flags as much, but. It's that's like what I'm looking for right now. My work is combining that with my self portraits and my portraits of flags as well. Um, this is a work that I'm also looking at, um, focusing on the stigma again, like I did when I talked about earlier the stigma that I face being HIV positive, um, and also the verbiage that people use on apps like Grindr and Scruff and everything when they talk about someone who's HIV positive and the question of, are you clean? Or telling people, oh, I'm clean. When in regards to they're just saying, oh, are you HIV positive or do you have STDs? Or no, I'm, I'm, I don't have HIV, I don't have STDs, so I'm a clean person. And so this is me exploring that in a different way. So I made myself its own little like body wash and it's like a way to kind of clean yourself of HIV or clean yourself of that with this idea that if you're HIV positive, you are not clean, you are dirty. And so with this project, I'm working on that. I'm also this idea of this, ver this words that people use of, on apps like this, where it becomes racist and when they say no rice, no spice and how problematic that can be and how like how hurtful that can be to people. And so I'm hoping to dive more into that work as well and explore the stigma that I face as HIV positive, but also the, the racism I face for being a brown person who's Filipino. And I don't know if this will play and I don't know if you'll be able to hear it, but this is also just a video I did. Person and persona. A person, multiple personas, some beaming and some not. So many personas, connecting and disconnecting from the person, coming together and falling apart. Old personas dying out, new personas being created finding out more about the person, discovering these personas and this person is who we are, ever changing and ever growing. Wind, the wind blowing, moving through this world, a constant force, never stopping to rest, faster and stronger, slower and softer, becoming one thing, then disappearing into nothing. Fag slash faggot. I am a fag. A cigarette or a queer person, I am a faggot, a bundle of sticks or a gay man. Words to describe who we are, what our identity is. The persona is multi-leveled and complicated. It is always developing and flourishing while also becoming stagnant and static. Am I a fag? Am I a faggot? Am I a Filipino? Am I American? Am I all these things and also none? The wind, a force as strong and gentle, a force that is always changing and moving, becoming something new as times change, but always being the wind. Will I continue to thrive, but also stay still? Becoming something new, but remembering who I used to be. I am a fag, I am a faggot, I am a Filipino, I am an American.
person and persona. A person, multiple personas, some beaming and some not. So many personas connecting and disconnecting from the person, coming together and falling apart. Old personas dying out, new personas being created, finding out more about the person, discovering these personas and this person is who we are, ever changing and ever growing. Wind, the wind blowing, moving through this world, a constant force, never stopping to rest, faster and stronger, slower and softer, becoming one thing, then disappearing into nothing. Fag slash faggot, I am a fag, a cigarette or a queer person, I am a faggot, a bundle of sticks or a gay man. Words to describe who we are, what our identity is. The persona is multi-leveled and complicated. It is always developing and flourishing while also becoming stagnant and static. Am I a fag? Am I a faggot? Am I a Filipino? Am I American? Am I all these things and also none? The wind, a force as strong and gentle, a force that is always changing and moving, becoming something new as times change, but always being the wind. Will I continue to thrive, but also stay still? Becoming something new, but remembering who I used to be. I am a fag. I am a faggot. I am a Filipino. I am an American. So yeah, that's just more of exploration of me. And also, if you could hear the last, uh, I guess, poem or whatever it was, fag slash faggot. And so that's also just me exploring those words that are problematic and are um, can be very hard to hear for some people. And for me, definitely, it was really hard to hear for many years in my life as a queer person, hearing that being said to me. But to me now, just kind of once again, reclaiming those words and using those words again as a way to kind of fuel my work and fuel myself and my photography, my artistry and moving forward and seeing um, what that will, where that will take me. And I think it's also one of those words that can really shock people. And I think that's a really good way to kind of start that discussion about my work and about those words and about how we see people, queer people. Can I ask the, the video piece that you shared at the end? Yes. So, so that's your original um, writing? Yes. Okay. Is, is that something that you often do? Do you write in relationship to the work that you create or? Uh, no, this is all something very new to me. The writing, I mean, besides my writing is always, as far as I do for my writing, it's always ever just been an artist statement here and there or an elevator statement, something just very general and quit, uh, just really strictly about the art. This is my first time really write, doing writing in regards to my work as a piece of it that is not just about it, but actually is part of the work itself. And right, so thanks. that's something I'm exploring and figuring out and seeing if I'm good at this or not. <laughs> Great, thank you for sharing that. Um, so I wanna remind everybody, uh, you can raise your hand and unmute and ask Eric a question if you would like. Equally, you could also use the chat function. So feel free to type your questions there and Andy and I, We'll, uh, we'll ask those questions for you. So if that's your preference. Oh, here, I've got one from Dr. Romo. Uh, which piece or work have you found to be most impactful to your followers? Um, I think my work that I think has been most impactful to my followers has been my self-portraits with queer people. I think them seeing a connection, me, uh, having a connection and relationship with these men in my life and it not being automatically sexual. Because I think as queer men, 
as a queer person, I think a lot of people see that and sexuality and sex is a big part of our community and the way we live our lives. But I wanted to also show that there's, we're more than that. I have, there's nothing, I have nothing against it, obviously, but my work, I think I wanted to show there's more, there's a, a love and a bond between queer men together. And when we, I photograph with them, it just, uh, you see that strong connection with us. And I think that has been the most impactful for my followers. If anything, it's been one of the most impactful for myself. Um, but actually for peace, I think two of the pieces I showed in the actual slideshow, me with my friend Isaiah on the stairs, um, and also the picture of me with the two men on my side in the red light, I think have also been the most impactful for work-wise from that series. I love that, Eric. I love the way that series really uh, highlights the solidarity yeah, you know, in addition to love, I mean, they're really beautiful. Um, uh, yeah, they're really, they're just really beautiful portraits. Wonderful. Thank you. So I, I appreciate you sharing today, um, sort of the ebbs and flows of your creative process. I think that's really important and something that, you know, artists and art students and, you know, we don't often talk about, like, it's not this constant, like, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, 100, 100 mile an hour kind of thing, right? Like, life gets in the way sometimes, um, you know, your mental health or your physical health might impact, uh, yeah. you know, sort of how, how creative, creatively, uh, you know, work flows and, you know, sort of those, those great moments and the, the challenges, right, that yeah. anybody has with regardless yeah. of what you do. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, can you talk a little more about, um, you know, just sort of the creative process for you and, you know, um, how it flows I love yeah that. definitely so a lot of my work um like during my time like during sva my inspiration i would just look at old like photo books and stat books in my library with like statues and paintings that i was just really looking for poses to help really inspire me because there was only, there's in my repertoire poses, I can only do so much. And so it was a nice way to kind of explore that more and that helped really inspire me. For other work, it's kind of just me looking back at my past work and seeing what I've done. And when I look back at my past work now, I sometimes see a different connection or see like a thread that goes through multiple pieces of work that I never saw before. And then I take that and start connecting it all again and then reshooting it something differently. So it all kind of threads together and connects at one time. Um, so that's kind of like how lately my inspiration has been coming from. And also I've been taking a lot of walks and seeing things that I think are beautiful or like inspire me to, and I'll just take that photo. Like the photo in my the slideshow of just the pride flag in front of that building, that's actually the photo that kind of started me on this whole process of my flag series and um, going forward and seeing what that meant to me. And it really all just started with a photo of a flag and that really inspired me to delve deeper in my relationship with myself as a queer Filipino American. Thanks, I also think it's interesting. Um, I love how you said that, you know, sort of your pre-diagnosis -di work, you know, you were passionate about photography, but not fully invested. And yeah. so then getting that diagnosis, which, you know, which some people would consider a, you know, a challenging moment, right, in one's life, um, that that really like ignited, um, you know, this focus and ambition in your work. And so, and you similarly, you talked about like sort of that ebb and flow during COVID and how, you know, the scare kind of, you know, again, lit this fire. And so I think it's interesting to talk about like challenging times actually being a fuel, you know, it's not just happy times. It's not just joy necessarily. Yeah. Um, one of the things that really there's, the sh there's a show I used to watch, Queer as Folk, the American one, and one of the characters in Queer as Folk um, is gay bashed. And after it happens, 
he a friend visits him and he's just in his room and there's photo, there's like drawings and paintings everywhere or something and he so explains that he's creating he's drawing to remind himself and to show people and show himself that what happened didn't they didn't get him like he's still there and so that's kind of that stuck with me after i saw that and then when i got my hiv status that's why i really got that drive it was a way to photographing everything and like all my ideas and was a way to kind of show myself that I was still there, that my HIV didn't get me, that it didn't stop me from doing anything, that if anything, it really kind of fueled my drive and got me to places that I never thought I would get to before my status. Right. So I think it's also interesting, you know, like looking at these images, you wouldn't necessarily know right, that you oh, are no. HIV positive. So it's not, it's not like an overt um, part, of, part of your image making, but being ill, uh, you know, it's an illness, right? And so, but it's not an illness that's necessarily visible. And so um, I think there's a tension between visibility and invisibility, right? If you live with an invisible illness. And so I just wonder if you could talk about that, that a little bit, the fact that, you know, you're trying to make visible the invisible in your mm -hmm. work a little bit. Um, yeah, just with my status, obviously, um, now, like, more, like, my future work, I actually am really talking more about my status and really focusing on it, but within my past work, yeah, I never really mentioned it unless you read my artist statement or if, like, you were in a critique with, like, my class and everything, because when you look at my work, you don't, obviously, you don't automatically see HIV, it's not like I spell it out and everything. And so going with my work, my HIV status in my work was never really um, the main focus. It was just like a stepping stone for me to really push myself more out there and like push my work. And so I uh, really, if anything, I just wanted to start a conversation about it. And then so if, someone saw my work and wanted to know more about it, then it could start a conversation. And then I can bring up my status and tell them about where that came from and making, that's in the sense of making the invisible visible for me in my past work. Or now in my future work, I'm really, I'm flat out saying like, this is a stigma, this is, this is my status and this is what I want to talk about and how I want to discuss it. Hi, Eric. Um, I'm going to read a question from the chat. That's OK. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, from Ariana, we have, uh, have you found that time has helped you connect with yourself uh, and found uh, in more inner love? I asked since I believe that we should that, uh, that we should never stop learning about one's one, especially when it comes to self-love. So sorry if I read that kind of fast, but no, it's OK. Um... Yeah, I definitely have found that time has helped me um, connect with myself and love myself more. Because um, when, as like when you come out as a gay, like when you come out of the closet and everything, it's definitely. I mean, everyone has their own journey and everyone has their own experience. And mine wasn't as dark as some people's have, as some people have dealt with. But there were times where it was hard for me. And so that kind of like shaped the way I saw myself when I was younger. And as I got older, um, I started to change things and think about things differently. But yeah, definitely time really kind of um, helped me find more of myself and a love for myself, especially with photography as like my way of doing it really helped me even more kind of find a love for myself I never thought I could find. Beautiful. Um, so Letty has a comment question. Um, she says, I really appreciate how you honor the intersectionality of your identities as a Filipino gay man. Have you always embraced this intersectionality or was it an evolution for you? Uh, it was an evolution for me. I mean, I'm always, I've never have shied away really of being like, I know I've always, I never have lied about my being Filipino and everything or say I'm not Filipino and say something else. Um, so I've always known I'm Filipino, been Filipino. 
but it's really been more recently where I've really started to like put those two together and like have those intersect and become like one identity. And so that's me. I'm now, I'm just really starting to explore that now and see where, who I am as a, not just a gay man, but a Filipino gay queer man and what that means to me and what that means to my work exactly. And how I want, um, what I want my work to say going forward now. I have a, a question that I like to ask, or will, will we like to ask uh, former Chafee students, um, because undoubtedly we will have a, a few maybe current students on the, the call and then potentially others watching in the future. Um, do you have any advice for, uh, or do you wish you had some advice when you were a photo student that you could maybe impart upon um, some of the students we have now? Oh, uh, yeah. So I think I don't know, advice that I would have given myself to a young, like, Chafee Eric would be to really um, build a connection with your peers and with your professors and your teachers and the people who work at Chafee. Um, within the photo department, I made a lot of really great friends and I made friends with my peers, but also friends with like my teachers and the people in the staff. And I really built strong connections. And I think it's, um, I think I would have, I wish I'd done that more when I was in, at Chafee. I had a kind of a close knit group of friends that I stuck with, but I think um, you should always really build a connection. Cause I think with, when it comes to community college, you kind of like, you come to class, you do what you're supposed to do and then you leave. And it, for photography at class, I think it's a little different because you are forced to do more interactive work with critiques and everything. But I definitely would tell people to really start to really build connections because you really don't know later down the line what that connection can do for you. And also, I think one of, I mean, it took a while for me to get to this idea, but to really take out every opportunity and like really make use of every opportunity you get, even if it's just like an assignment, like really make use of that assignment and do what you have to do to get that grade, but also push yourself a little more and to see what else you could do because I've done assignments that I look back at now and I now see where I could have done, gone farther. And now I've taken that idea and redid it and seeing how to push it farther now as a older person. <laughs> Erica, so because today is World's AIDS, uh, World AIDS Day, can I ask in your opinion, um, does contemporary art have a role in the field of public health? What do you think? Um, yes, I believe it does. I think just, I mean, since art has ever, since the beginning of art and the way art affects people, it's always been a conversation starter. Art has always pushed boundaries and pushed narratives that we wanted to be pushed out there to really change the world. So I think art is just such a intelligent way of getting your point across without having to say much sometimes. And so I think it would it's really good to have that in the conversation with, with public health because it can really give people a better idea because you can explain something to someone but then sometimes if they see a photo or a drawing or a painting or like a short like a film about it it really sticks with them more and so I think art has definitely a, a place in a contemporary art has definitely a place in the discussion with public health because it helps start a discussion it helps com people confront things and uh helps push boundaries that I know some people are trying to keep up. I have kind of a, a follow-up question to my previous one. I, I'm sorry, this is a little out of order. Oh, that's okay. But, uh, uh, do you, in terms of going in the theme of advice for, for others, um, do you ha possibly have any advice for, for those who um, may not have support 
um, from their for their families um, as they pursue their creative career? I mean, I'm oh. not sure how that would affect you necessarily, but if there's anything you could say. Um, I think if, yeah, it's, I mean, I've always had support by my, from my family. They've always been super supportive of my choice to be a photographer and this like career path I've chosen. But I definitely think just also as like, from my experience as a queer person, it's also building your own family and your chosen family. And so building that chosen family within your peers and your friends and your professors and the people in your coworkers is a great way to like still get that kind of support, even if it's not from your direct family or your blood family. It's your chosen family that can also really help inspire you and push you farther. That's a really great way of looking at it. Thanks. Welcome. Eric, you often, um, obviously you often work in series. Can you talk a little bit about um, why you prefer working in a series and how do you know if something's working? Um, yeah, so actually I just had a conversation with my friend Tony about this, about um, series work, how I'm so used, one of the big reasons why I all my work is always a series is just because I'm so used to doing a work, a series of work. It's just the way I've been trained with my photography with like all my schooling. It's always just been have an idea, create a, a body of work. And so that's why I've just been trained. So all my work is always just a series because that's what I'm used to. And I just love creating a series of work. I'm actually trying to still create series work, but also just be okay with just doing a one-off photo that is strong and powerful, but doesn't need, you know, five more photos after it to like tell more of the story. But um, in terms of it working, it's for me, it just, you just keep shooting. And I always just keep shooting and seeing, I start doing multiple photos, different styles, different like setups and everything. And then if I look at it all and I see that it's not all connecting or I, if I see that um, it's not telling the story I want to do, or it's just, it's just not, working for me it just doesn't like excite me then that's just kind of the way where I feel like okay like this is I can shelf this for now because a lot of times I I rarely just give up on my ideas I just kind of usually shelf them and try to go back to it at a later date because sometimes I just need my mind and my myself to be at a different part like different point in my life then when I look back at it again I feel like oh, okay you know what I can do this this way, this time now. And so it just looking back at like, that's why my love, that's why I was looking back at past work because it just, you see things differently now. Uh, would, would you be able to talk about um, the role of social, social media for you as an artist and how it's a useful tool potentially? Yeah, so social media has all like, I have grown up with social media but being so using social media and being an artist has um it's definitely been like a struggle to like keep up with it because I definitely I have my personal Instagram but then I have like my photo Instagram and so I over the past like couple few years now I've really started being better at curating stuff for my photo Instagram but also like just still posting here and there for my professional and um, it's definitely helped my having an Instagram is really, or having this, my work on social media has definitely helped give me opportunities that I wouldn't have gotten if I didn't have social media and everything. And it just helps me reach out to people and people can reach out to me if they find my social media and everything and find my Instagram and they get to see my work. And it just really helps me connect with other people and other artists. So I definitely think, um, I think social media is really great for art and a way to get your art out there and to a way to like build relationships with people. I mean, there definitely are like flaws with social media, but I've definitely found a lot of the positives of it. So Eric, I have um, one more HIV positive question. Um, and you kind of touched on this, but I think it's interesting, like how, how do you balance your own sense of privacy 
um, with a sense of responsibility to visualize, um, you know, a personal experience, but a public health crisis at the same time. That's interesting. Like, how do you, it sounds like you've kind of come to terms and like you feel more, um, you feel strongly about um, fighting stigma in your work. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you could talk a little bit about that. I think it was just, like I was okay for like, I mean, I've been positive now for almost, oh my gosh, almost 10 years now. Um, but uh, in the beginning, like, or throughout most beginning of the years, it was definitely like this whole, it was like levels of it where I never talked about it at all to, I'll talk about it here and there to this group of people all will all know about because they're all in my circle of people who I'm doing work with or art school with and everything to now it's gotten to a point where like you said where I want to like give more of a voice and everything and like make use of my platform and really not be silent anymore because I never was super silent regarding my status like if someone had asked me I would tell them or if someone looked at my work and you know asked me I would tell them yeah I am HB positive but it's never been something I really blatantly kind of show off and everything but um it's definitely been a journey for me to kind of get to this point where I am really comfortable with my status and well I've always not just comfortable with status but talking about it and wanting to do like have it be more of a, on the forefront of my work and not just kind of like in the back the background Thanks, Eric. Um, so Roman has a question here in the chat, uh, question and comment. It's interesting how the aesthetic fits or creates nuance in the work. The intentional aesthetic you mentioned at SVA was a queer nightlife aesthetic, which you can see, but it also gives the nudity a different quality or maybe creates a different tone. The newer work without the gels has the same nudity, but the tone might read differently. Have you noticed a different response to the work based on the aesthetic in your uh, older versus newer work? And is there a different response to the theatrical versus more documentary aesthetic or a queer aesthetic? Um, I definitely have, based on just like, if I'm looking at like a general idea of like my work and if I'm looking at just like likes on Instagram about it, I definitely see that I get more of a response when it comes to my work that has like gels and there's colors and it's just, it gets more eye catching. And I guess for people a lot, I don't know, to not make it so like a word, but just like pretty, I guess. But um, I also don't, I, just, I still feel like it's the same kind of work and everything. It's just that now I just don't, like some work has gels and some work doesn't. And so I still feel like it's the same kind of idea, but just without gels and without, with, and without gels and everything. Um, in response to the theatrical versus documentary and the queer aesthetic, um, I definitely, the conversation is always, the stuff I get is a different conversation regarding whatever, if it's a queer aesthetic or if it's more of a theatrical or documentary aesthetic, that's kind of the response that I usually get. It just, it's a difference of question, a different conversation that comes up with it. So it just kind of just depends on what the work is and that kind of gives off the, the discussion. Thanks for that. Um, so I'd love to ask, uh, you know, it's always interesting to hear who artists are inspired by, what's exciting them right now. So I'd love to know, any artists um, or uh, you know folks whose work you would recommend to our audience uh, and whose work you'd like to amplify? Oh yeah, so I definitely thought about this. So like work that like artists that like really I'll constantly look at or just like people I follow that I think just make really beautiful work. Um, and one guy, I met him when I lived in New York and connected a couple of times. Uh, Pacifico Solano is a really cool queer artist that does a lot of great archive work with uh, old like magazines and like artwork of queer, like uh, regarding 
queer people and everything and just like the way he puts it together and collages it is really beautiful. Um, Paul Sapuya is also like an amazing photographer that I just love so much and his portraits he does, his self-portraits are always just so inspiring to me and it really helps inspire my work as well. Um, Jason, I don't know if I pronounced this right correctly though, it was Bo, Bo Key. He does like portraits um, that are really beautiful as well that of queer men. And so that's another just artist that I just get inspired by like just for, as another person, as a person who also photographs queer men or photographs myself as queer men, it's a nice person to connect with. And um, one other photographer that I think I met her when I when I worked in, or when I worked when I, I went to SVA, she went to SVA with me too. Um, she is definitely like an inspiration, just on inspiration in the sense that she inspires my work, but inspires me to like, just go for things and to try it out. Her name is uh, Sinjin Strom. She's just an amazing artist all around that if you follow, like you should all like follow her if you ever just wanna be inspired by work and inspired by someone's drive to create work and everything. She is also a big person that I look up to and I talk to every once in a while to really just kind of help refocus myself and my work and find balance. Cause I think she's a really great person to talk to and look at because just of the kind of work she creates and the stuff she does to make that work is really beautiful. Great, thank you. Um, Roman's putting links in the chat uh, when we're able to find a website or Instagram, uh, definitely. So we'll share that with all of you today and we'll also share it in a follow-up email. Okay, yeah, Roman just found uh, Sinjin. Oh, Strom, I see, okay. Oh yeah, Strom, well, sorry. And then Jason Vo Key, we, we think. We might need spelling on that. I'm... Uh, his last name is B-O-E-C-K-L-I. Okay, got it. Cool, great, we'll share that. Um, well, thank you so much, Eric. Uh, last call for questions for Eric. Um, definitely raise your hand or unmute or throw it in the chat. Um, but I really want to thank you. I'm so excited to have you here as an alum of Student Invitational of Chafee College. Uh, really fantastic. So we love seeing where you're going and um, can't wait to hear where you land next and uh, continued flag work potentially. Yes. <laughs> seeing, seeing that. Oh, good. Okay. Roman found that. Um, and then Roman also did include a quick uh, or a link to a very quick two minute survey. We'd love to get your feedback. It helps us to plan for the future. So I really appreciate you all taking a moment to do that if you would. But Eric, uh, thrilled to have you here. Thank you so much for your time and energy. And we appreciate all of you who took time out of your day to, to be with us here. Thank you so much. Please take care, stay safe and healthy. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Visit us at www.chafee.edu slash Wignall to access our full schedule of programs and our available recordings. Thank you for joining us.